Hey guys! One of the main principles of the AngularJS framework is to extend the HTML vocabulary for your application, turning your markup into a more concise, readable and meaningful templating tool. This is achieved by the use of directives. Directives are a fundamental part and one of the most important aspects of AngularJS. In this section, we're going to take a deeper look at Angular directives. We're going to review the important directives we have already seen, and then we will dive in and learn about the process of writing custom directives. So let's get to it. First of all, AngularJS comes bundled with a wide variety of directives that will serve many general purposes on your application. Let's take a look at some of the most important directives available in the framework by default. Let's open up some code from previous exercises again and see what we find. First, the ng-app directive is responsible for auto-bootstrapping your AngularJS application. It designates the root element of the application and is typically placed near the root element of the page, like the body or the HTML tags. It basically defines where your application starts and ends within the page. Moving on, we have the ng model directive. This one binds an input, select, text area or custom form control to a property on the scope, providing two ways data binding between the value of the property and the value you see on screen. The ng model gets an expression as a parameter and will try to bind to the property given by evaluating the expression against the current scope. If the property doesn't already exist on the scope, it will be created implicitly and added to the then, we have the ng-repeat directive that replicates a template once per item from a collection. Each template instance gets its own scope, where the given loop variable is set to the current collection item and $index is set to the item index or key. The $index is not the only special property available in the ng-repeat scope, however. Here is a table of the special properties you can use inside of your ng-repeat loop. Another thing to note about the ng-repeat directive is that you do not necessarily need a single HTML element to contain your whole template. If you have a long template or want to define explicitly a starting and an ending point to the repeat template, you can use the ng-repeat start and ng-repeat end directive, like in the following example. In this example, the entire markup will be considered as the template including the header and the footer tags. Then, we have the ng-controller directive. It attaches a controller class to the view. This is a key aspect of how the model view controller pattern is handled in AngularJS. The ng-controller takes a single parameter, which is the name of the controller you want to be in charge of your view. As we saw in the application we developed in the last section, the use of Angular routes allows you to bind your views to your controllers without necessarily having to use the ng-controller directive. Still, it's a very useful thing to know. Speaking of routes, the ng-view directive complements the route service by including the template of the current route in the main layout file. Every time the current route changes, the included view changes with it according to the configuration of the route service. It requires the ng-route module to be installed, but it's still one of the most important ones. It does not take any parameter. Moving on with the directives, it's time to take a look at the event handling directives available in AngularJS. But first, let's stop for a second and talk about the Angular way of doing event handling. If you ever used jQuery and try to bind a method to the click event of a DOM element, you probably use something like this. In AngularJS, however, you would simply have something like this. This is a major shift in the way you use to bind methods to event handlers using JavaScript and is a good example to illustrate how Angular templates are powerful. In the old jQuery way, in order to understand the event handlers, you need to read the HTML template and the JavaScript that associates the action with the DOM elements. In AngularJS, it's way simpler. Since the HTML element, the event handler and the action are all declared in a single place. There are as many directives as possible DOM events. You can use ng-click for the click event, ng-submit for the form submission event, ng-mouseover for the mouseover event, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, 
Let's move on for the next directive, the form directive. But wait a minute, just form, no ng? Is that even a directive? Doesn't HTML already have a form element? Well, since the role of forms in client-side Angular applications is different than in your classical apps, it is desirable for the browser not to translate the form submission into a full page reload that sends the data to the server. That's why AngularJS slightly changes the behavior that you would usually expect from the HTML form element. So, when you use a form in your AngularJS app, you're actually using the Angular form directive, not just the HTML form. By default, the Angular form prevents the form submission to the server unless the form element has an action attribute specified. You usually use that action to hook up the controller action that handles your form. You can use one of the following two ways to specify what JavaScript method should be called when a form is submitted. You can use the ng-submit directive on the form element like this, or you can use the ng-click directive on the first button or input field of type submit. Now, let's take a very quick look at some other Angular simpler directives that can be extremely useful. The ng-hide and the ng-show directives will hide or show your element via CSS, depending if the expression passed returns true or false. The ng-switch directive is used to conditionally swap DOM elements on your template based on a scope expression. If your template structure depends somehow on a conditional, just use the ng-switch as the following example. The ng-class directive will add arbitrary CSS classes to your element if the expression returns true. The ng-style directive allows you to bind arbitrary inline style to elements, like the following. The ng disable directive, in a similar fashion, will set the element as disabled or not depending on the expression returning false or true. The ng pluralize directive, we've seen this one in action before, will help you to display messages that may have a plural form depending on the numerical value, like a view counter in the following example. Finally, AngularJS sometimes may cause problems during page load times trying to load source URL and hrefs before the expressions are resolved. To avoid that, we generally use ngsrc and nghref instead of the pure HTML counterpart. This will prevent resource load errors and wrong links during your page load. And those were just a few of the most used directives available by default in Angular. It's not my intention to cover every single directive here, but it's good to at least have a place to start. In the next video, we're going to find out how to write our own custom directives and implement any behavior or application needs that's not available by default. See you there!